to may have this evening and I hope we may come to share during the course of this weekend this is the most important thing of all isn't it we are not here simply to meet with each other we are here that we might meet with him I always remember possibly the first students conference I ever attended Mrs. J. O. Fraser was the kind of house mother and she is the widow of J. O. Fraser of Lisu Land. If you've ever read a book that the CIM have published called Behind the Ranges, you'll know something about the work of J. O. Fraser of Lisu Land. If you haven't seen that book, I commend it to you. It's recently been republished in paperback edition. There was an amazing work of God done in that place. And this lady, obviously a woman who had known God in a deep way came to preside over our gathering the opening words that she used as she got up to speak to us just about where we'd get extra blankets from and things like that but she said this to us I've never forgotten it and it must be 15, 16 more years ago she said I often feel when we come to places like this asking myself this to what end is it if we dwell in Jerusalem and see not the king's face? To what end is it if we dwell in Jerusalem and see not the king's face? It seems to me that this is the thing that we need to be keeping before us all the time during this weekend that we're here really that we might meet with God that will mean a different thing every one of us here I would think means something entirely different for me from what it means to any of you but God has something I am sure that he wants to meet with us about now the three studies that we are to have during these three sessions that I will be involved in are studies in our Lord's dealings with three different people and the lessons that we learn from them particularly I would think the lessons that we learn from them about biblical evangelism because as you know this year in Dundee is to be a year when we believe that God has set our hands and our hearts to the task of reaching out to others to seek to bring Christ to them and to bring them to Christ and I'm hoping that we may take away from this weekend amongst many other things a clearer understanding of the biblical priorities in evangelism and that God may put a burden on our hearts for people it's been suggested to me that we might look at three different individuals this evening at Nicodemus about whom we've just been reading tomorrow about the woman of Samaria and in the afternoon tomorrow about the rich young ruler you will see the wide scope that's involved in these three different people Nicodemus the devout and serious and religious and thoughtful man the woman of Samaria who is a superficial and probably immoral woman of the world and then the rich young ruler this good wholesome young man who commended himself to Jesus upon whom Jesus looked and wearied and he loved him now lest we misunderstand let me say that my concern is certainly not that we should look at these people as types of people with whom Jesus dealt I always remember a mission that I was engaged in many years ago when someone came to discuss with us types you will meet and to suggest to us the different kinds of approaches that God makes to different types of people now you know I don't think Jesus ever saw people as types 
and there's something in my soul and I'm sure in yours that would shrink from this idea the point of this rather is that there are general lessons to be learned here for a right thinking and therefore a right approach in our seeking to bring Christ to people and people to Christ and I want us to look in the time we have this evening and I'm sure that you're tired at the end of a week and at the end of a day and you've been traveling and you don't want me to keep you too long about Nicodemus whose name we read of three times in John's Gospel and nowhere else here in chapter 3 in this lengthy passage his encounter with Jesus and then again in chapter 7 at verse 50 where he as a member of the Sanhedrin is counseling caution in the dealings of the Sanhedrin with Jesus who are about to plot his destruction and then ultimately in chapter 19 verse 39 where we read of Nicodemus along with Joseph of Arimathea assisting at Jesus burial there are just one or two things about Nicodemus' character which seem important if we are going to grasp the point of his appearing in the New Testament he is a Pharisee in verse 1 of John 3 there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus and while obviously not entirely of the same ilk as those upon whom Jesus poured so much scorn and abuse during his ministry it is true that Nicodemus shares the characteristics of this group of men who in so many ways started off so well this is the strange thing about these people it's the strange and sad story of course of so many people they started off so well with such high ideals and with such a zealous regard for God in fact this was their other name they were the zealots and yet something sour crept into their life and into their group indeed and in fact you see the Pharisees are a great tragedy the whole story of the Pharisees is a tragedy the tragedy of men who started with such high ideals and with such orthodox ideas even and indeed the reason that they separated from others and the word Pharisee means as you know perhaps a separated one the reason they separated themselves from others was that they found that there was a denial of the truth among certain other people but something hard and sour entered into their souls and you get in the Gospels the picture of the Pharisee quite unrecognizable if I may say so from the earlier experience that you could have had if you'd seen them in pre gospel days but you get this harshness this sourness of spirit which has entered in and you know one ought never to read of men like these without crying to God that he would deliver us from ever becoming like this you know there are a thousand different ways in which the devil can divert people and this is one of them and it clearly happened amongst these Pharisees like them Nicodemus's concept of religion and I think it's the right word to use that his concept of religion had become externalized this was the tragedy and this is the same level at which this kind of thing can happen to people so easily you know that their life becomes a matter of externals there was once something far more than this amongst the Pharisees but it has become something that's merely a matter of externals external orthodoxy they were orthodox to a degree but this harsh religious externalism has entered into their life and this was true of Nicodemus too the religion of the Pharisees of course was a religion of works of seeking to please God and satisfy God and enter the kingdom of God through the things that they could do and you find an example of this of course clearly in Nicodemus 
Not only is he a Pharisee, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, which puts him into a sort of special class of his own. And he is a man of distinction, a man who would undoubtedly be greatly respected and highly honored amongst his fellow Jews. It's therefore an important thing, I think, to recognize the impact which Jesus has already made on Nicodemus before we come to chapter 3 of John at all. So that Nicodemus' prejudice is so far brought down as to acknowledge an untrained Galilean like Jesus as a teacher sent from God. Now, this is obviously something that has had an impact upon Nicodemus's life. You notice the response and the reaction of Jesus to him. One of the things that has been striking me as I've been reading this passage again this week, and of course one of the problems of it, isn't it true, is that it's so familiar. Do you ever find this with certain parts of the scripture? It's so familiar. You come to it and there are so many things that you've begun to understand from it in previous days and they come back to you and you tend to glide over it. I hope we may be especially praying that with these passages that are so familiar to us in this weekend, God will be able to penetrate to our hearts in a fresh way, even with truths that we have already known. One of the interesting things that has struck me is how real Jesus is with Nicodemus. How real he is with him. Do you notice that when Jesus comes to Nicodemus there is no undue deference that he pays to him. He was quite an important fish to have caught coming to Jesus' house seeking him out, you know. And yet Jesus pays no undue deference to him. There's no sort of sense of an eager over politeness or a sense of the occasion no accommodation of Nicodemus Jesus comes to him and presents him with his own diagnosis of Nicodemus's deep seated need so that Nicodemus doesn't even get to the stage of asking a question do you notice he comes to Jesus and makes a statement and immediately Jesus almost seems to brush aside the matter that Nicodemus has raised and goes straight to the point fastening on the man's deep-seated need. That arises, I'm sure, from what we read at the end of chapter 2. Do you notice the lead-in to the third chapter in John? Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus you notice he knew what was in man he didn't need anybody to tell him about this he knew what was in man and there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus and Jesus comes to penetrate into the depths of Nicodemus' true need so between verses 2 and 3 of John chapter 3 you get the stark contrast between the externalism of the cultured Pharisee and the heart religion which is the essence of Jesus' gospel. And Nicodemus is confronted immediately with the need that Jesus sees for a radical work of God in the depths of the man's heart. Now you'll notice the twofold sphere in which Jesus begins to deal with Nicodemus. The two spheres in which Nicodemus is mistaken and blind. Jesus says to him, except a man be born again, and there immediately he is going beyond any level at which Nicodemus has ever begun to think. His thinking has all been at the level of Jesus as a teacher, and what kind of teacher he is to have been able to do signs like these. And undoubtedly Nicodemus is coming to Jesus in order that his own understanding of the law perhaps may be increased. And Jesus' 
lead him down into this depth that he had never imagined before. Where he says, what your need is, Nicodemus, is for such a radical work of God in your heart that it could only be paralleled by a new birth. Nicodemus has this misunderstanding, first of all then, of himself. He sees himself in need of further teaching and of further enlightenment. And he has a misunderstanding about Jesus too. He sees Jesus as the one who may be able to supply this need. Now you notice that there are two phrases in verse 7 and in verse 14 which point to Jesus' correction of Nicodemus' misunderstandings in these two spheres. Jesus presents Nicodemus with the very disturbing fact for him that what he needs is not new teaching but new life. And that's the first must in verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And then he presents himself not as a great teacher, but as a great saviour and life giver. And the key phrase in verse 14, the son of man must be lifted up. Now these two phrases point to the way that Jesus deals with Nicodemus' misunderstanding and blindness first about himself and then about Jesus. You must be born again. The Son of Man must be lifted up. You look at the first of these where Jesus points Nicodemus to the fact that without this new birth he is actually outside of the kingdom. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, verse 3. And verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Not only so, but Nicodemus is, says Jesus, blind respecting the things of the kingdom. He can't see. He can't understand. And Nicodemus goes on to prove how true this is in verse 4, where he says, How can a man be born when he is old? He has mistaken reformation for regeneration. He says to him, How can he start and go back to the beginning again? You know the kind of thing that people sometimes, when they are exercised about themselves, say, if I just had my life to live all over again. Now this is the level at which Nicodemus is thinking. And Jesus says to him, you see, you are blind about the things of the kingdom because this is not concerned with a mere going back over your own life again. It is a new kind of life that you are needing to receive. And he is blind to this. Very important thing to notice, incidentally, that this is just one of many marks of the man who has never known what Jesus is talking about here, this new birth. He can't see. He's blind. The God of this world, Paul puts it in different language, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. If our gospel be hid, it is hidden to them that are lost, because the God of this world has blinded their minds they can't see. And when people say, you know, I don't see things that way, I just can't see this, they are speaking the literal truth. This is exactly the situation. Now, nothing short of a radical recreating work of God will deal with this, you see. This is why true evangelism is not a matter of techniques or methods primarily. It's a matter of something that only God can do. You need to be born from above, says Jesus. And Paul puts the same thing into different language when he says, 
If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Now he says, the reason we see is just this, that the same God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. The reason that we see, in other words, is not because of anything in ourselves. It's because of something that has taken place in us when we were born again, which is only paralleled by the creation of the world at the beginning. Now, do you see what a different concept this puts upon somebody's conversion? When Paul is looking for something that is a true parallel, to what has happened when the grace of God visited his life, he searches around and the only thing he can find is the creation of the world at the beginning when there was nothing but utter darkness and God spoke out into the darkness with the divine fiat, let there be light and there was light and began to call into being everything that is now, says Paul, it is exactly the same thing that has happened, something of the same dimension in our hearts when the light of the knowledge of the glory of God dawned upon us and Jesus in using this picture of new birth is speaking of something of the same dimension and a man will never see the kingdom of God not just in the sense of entering into it but he will never see it and be able to understand what it's all about until he is born again. Still further, nothing he can do will enable him to enter it, verse 5, because he is like a man paralyzed. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, that probably is a reference to John the Baptist's baptism and to the repentance which Nicodemus had declined. That's an important thing which would take us a long time all on its own. But I'm sure that what Jesus is referring to is born of water. This looks back to John the Baptist's baptism where men were coming repenting and crying to John and to God for the way of grace. And Nicodemus and the other proud Pharisees would have none of this, you see. That's why Jesus so often came back to John the Baptist. A very interesting line of study in the Gospels, you know. When Jesus comes to them, he says, What do you say of John? Was he of God or of men? And he keeps referring people back again to John the Baptist. He says, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, that is not just born of the flesh, for that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but born of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He is as a man who is not only blind, but paralyzed. But more than this, now do you notice the process by which Jesus is humbling Nicodemus? He comes to him, you see, as the cultured religious man with his pride in all that the Pharisees stood for and all that Nicodemus had attained to. And Jesus ruthlessly, one might say, humbles him further and further down until Nicodemus is in the place where he is in the dust, as it were, in Jesus' eyes where he will begin to recognize that the only thing that will meet his case is something as radical as a new birth, as a new creation. And he tells him, not only, you see, is he outside of the kingdom. Now Nicodemus would have felt that if anybody was in the kingdom, it was he. He says, you are actually outside of it. And because of being outside of it and lacking this new birth, you are blind. Nor is there anything that you can do to get yourself into the kingdom. You are paralyzed. Like that man who stood out or sat outside the beautiful gate of the temple, you remember. In Acts chapter 3, he is suffering from paralysis. He couldn't get himself anywhere. And he, incidentally in Acts chapter 3, is a picture of the paralysis of the religious experience of so many of these people within the temple. Now that was a picture of Nicodemus. Jesus says, 
Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But there is more than this. In verse 14, do you notice? And this is an important thing for an understanding of what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. You can't relegate this part of the chapter out of the way. It's an important and central part of it. The condition of such a man, says Jesus, is paralleled by the condition of the Israelites in the wilderness. Now you remember the story of how the serpents began to plague the children of Israel. And all over the camp people were beginning to discover that this plague was coming upon them and they were suffering from snake poison. And they were dying in multitudes and death was written over the whole of the camp. And they were in utter agony and came to Moses calling to him, Can you cry to God for us about this? Now Jesus says, do you notice, that the condition of such a man who is not born again is paralleled by the condition of the Israelites in the wilderness. So that a man like Nicodemus has a heart which is diseased, a future which holds only despair and hopelessness, and he is perishing. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now being born again is all about getting life. Being born is the way to get physical life. Being born from above, which is what the word again really means, is being given spiritual life, eternal life. Jesus says, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have eternal life. And Nicodemus and all men like him are placed therefore in this position that they have hearts which are diseased, a future which holds only hopelessness and despair. And the truest description of them is that they are perishing. Now, this is why Jesus brings to Nicodemus this need, you see, for such a radical work of grace as the new birth implies. Neither renovation nor reformation will do. What Jesus brings him face to face with is his need for regeneration. And the very figure of birth drives this home even more relentlessly, doesn't it? Because you contribute nothing to your own birth physically. Birth is something that happens to you. You don't decide to be born. You don't choose the day of your birth. Neither do you contribute to your birth. It's something that is wholly done for you. And so the new birth is something that is holy of God. Except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John referring to the same thing in John chapter 1 verse 12 speaks of those who received him as those to whom it is given power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now you can imagine what a blow this is to Nicodemus's pride. May I read to you, if we have time, some words of an American Jew about this very thing. Jesus' word, he says, regarding the new birth, shatters once for all every supposed excellence of man's attainment, all merit of human deeds, all prerogatives of natural birth or station. Spiritual birth is something one undergoes, not something one produces. As our efforts had nothing to do with our natural conception and birth, so in an analogous way, but on a far higher plane, regeneration is not a work of ours. Now, 
What a blow that was for Nicodemus. His being a Jew gave him no part in the kingdom. His being a Pharisee esteemed holier than other people availed him nothing. His membership in the Sanhedrin and his fame as one of its scribes went for naught. This rabbi from Galilee calmly tells him that he is not yet in the kingdom and everything on which he had built his hopes throughout a long, arduous life sink in ruins and become a little worthless heap of ashes. Now you know that is characteristic of a true work of grace in someone's heart at some stage, at some stage, when you see yourself within the light of all this, and everything that you have imagined yourself to be and all your inflated notions of yourself, the great big bubble with all its multicolored hues and all its vastness bursts. And you discover that it's nothing but a drop of dirty water. Now this is what's happened to Nicodemus, you see. This is the painful process from which he shrinks and turns away. One wonders whether there is really any evidence that Nicodemus was ever really ready to face this. It's a very costly thing to face. And you know, if you are going to go anywhere with God at all, this is the kind of thing that you're going to have to face. This cutting edge of the Word of God and the Spirit of God to bring you down to size. And one of the things that does that is this doctrine of the new birth. You see. You notice now the picture Jesus gives of himself to Nicodemus. Nicodemus' misunderstanding of Jesus, he says that he was a teacher. In verse 2, Rabbi, he says, we know that you are a teacher come from God because nobody can have these signs following his teaching except he comes from God. We know you are a teacher. A great teacher and preacher is Nicodemus's misunderstanding and it's a common one. Now, of course, it's true, as the Gospels tell us, that Jesus came preaching the kingdom. But let me try to clarify this for you. Jesus came preaching the kingdom but he didn't come in order to preach a gospel. He came in order that there might be a gospel to preach. And that's a very different thing. So that the true significance of Jesus is not primarily in his teaching, in the gospel he came to preach. The true significance of Jesus is in what he came to do and to become so that there might be a gospel. And this is the point of the second must in verse 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. <coughs> now this term lifted up in John always refers to the cross. It doesn't simply refer to the idea of Jesus being seen or exalted. It refers specifically to the cross. Uh, for example, in chapter 8 and in verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And again in chapter 12, verse 32 and 33, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, that men who are perishing will receive what is received at birth, which is life, through his death. And this is what he means when he speaks about being lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that men who are in the same condition as Nicodemus, blind and paralyzed, 
and perishing if they turn from themselves as these men had to turn from everything in the wilderness of Israel to look to the brazen serpent if they turn from themselves to Christ then they will discover into their deadness life coming now that leads me on to what I think it might be most profitable if we spent the rest of our time doing this evening and that is to ask the question what is this new birth of which Jesus speaks so much to Nicodemus what is this regeneration which is the word we use for the new birth may I suggest and I shall obviously just be speaking in outline certain things which the scriptures teach about this new birth primarily the meaning of it of course is a quickening a bringing of life to the dead and the reason that Jesus says to Nicodemus when he finds it so difficult to understand this and betrays his blindness how can these things be he says Jesus answered and said to him are you a master of Israel and knowest not these things because you see out of the Old Testament scriptures Nicodemus ought to have known what this new life meant it's the kind of thing for example that you get in Ezekiel where Ezekiel is taken to see this picture of a valley that's filled with dry bones and this is a picture of the deadness of the human heart and Ezekiel is asked by God son of man can these bones live and you remember what happens what happens that day as Ezekiel and we'll see the significance of this for the new birth presently as Ezekiel prophesies to the dry bones and speaks the word of God to them and says ye dry bones live then the breath of the Spirit of God comes upon them and into this place that is dark and dank and dead there comes the Spirit of life and these dry bones in all their deadness are clothed with flesh and begin to pulsate with life and where there was nothing but death this valley of death becomes a valley that is bounding with life you get the same kind of thing in illustrated in Jesus encounter with Lazarus this is the illustration of the same kind of thing where Lazarus is down in the tomb sealed and dark and dead and Jesus comes and stands outside the tomb and calls down now you will notice it's a word that does it again he calls out to him Lazarus come forth and as the crowd watch breathlessly here is Lazarus coming out of this tomb into the daylight bringing his grave clothes with him and this is the kind of thing that the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit involves and means it is what one old writer whose book has been republished by the IVF a man called Henry Skugel called the life of God in the soul of man now that's one of the best possible descriptions of what the new birth means it is the life of God coming into the soul of man and this is what Jesus tells Nicodemus he needs a bringing of life to the dead now true Christian experience is nothing less than this you see this is something that we need to grasp this is what has happened to you if you are a true child of God this is not just something that you have made a decision about in some corner of your life this is something that is only paralleled by the resurrection you see it is the same divine energy which brought Jesus from the grave which has laid hold of you and resurrected you according to the working of his mighty power in us, says Paul. 
whereby he brought Jesus from the dead. Now that's what has happened to you if you're a true child of God. The life of God is now in the soul of this man. And you know, I think we need to be saying that to ourselves, do we not? I think in these days of devaluation, you know, the whole idea of just what it means to be a child of God has been devalued. Is not this perhaps why some of us are looking for something else in our spiritual life, some other kind of experience? We say, oh, I've been converted, but there's something else that I'm searching out after. Now, you know, I think I know what people mean when they say that, and there may be something that God has yet to do in your soul, but if we just grasp what it meant to be born of God, it would transform our lives often, I think. If we were to realize that out of the dark grave of our deadness in trespasses and sins, Christ has called us, saying to us by name, when the call of the gospel sounded in our hearts, Come forth! And what happened was that out of our darkness and deadness, we arose, went forth, and followed him. This is what Wesley says, you see, in that great hymn that we sang, which he wrote after his conversion. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night, Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I rose, the dungeon flamed with light. Now the dungeon is a dark dungeon of death. And not only do we need to remind ourselves that this is what has happened to us when God came to us in his mercy in Christ, and we have been raised together with him. We need to keep on saying this to ourselves. I live, that's what Paul was doing, see, but not I. It is Christ who lives in me, the life of God in the soul of man. But we need to keep saying to ourselves that however cultured and refined and religious a man may be, we need to face the facts that unless he has known the birth that Christ is speaking of here. He is in the same sense dead as that valley of dry bones. He's dead. He's outside of the kingdom. He's blind. He's paralyzed. He's unable to do anything about it. That's the biblical description of a man without the new birth. Second thing is that it is a sovereign activity of the Holy Spirit, this new birth, which man can neither engineer nor fully understand. We have referred to this already from the very idea of birth, that the birth is a birth from above, that is not from the will of man nor the will of the flesh, but from God. But Jesus emphasizes this to Nicodemus in verse 8 in this parable of the wind marvel not that I said unto thee ye must be born again the wind bloweth where it listeth and you hear the sound thereof but you can't tell whence it comes or whither it goes so is every one that is born of the spirit now the point about this is not to parallel the new birth with the whim and caprice of the wind as it were but with the sovereign activity of the wind no man can control it no man can engineer it in its movement the wind is sovereign and in the same sense we are born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God and there is a sense in which therefore this is something we shall never fully be able to understand. You see the signs of it, but you can't tell whence it comes or whether it goes, says Jesus. There is something sovereign and there is something inscrutable about it. That's the second thing. My goodness me, my clock goes round twice the speed of anybody else's.
third thing is this and I hope you will be able to follow these next two factors the first there are no true spiritual activities without regeneration there are no true spiritual activities without regeneration except a man be born of water and of the spirit I suggest to you simply that that born of water is a reference to repentance it may also be a reference to the cleansing which comes in regeneration except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God and the significance of this is that there are no true spiritual activities without regeneration this paralysis has gripped men it's for this reason of course that Paul tells us that everything that we have in our salvation is a gift of God there are no true spiritual activities without regeneration the fourth thing ties in with it and it's this contrary wise there is no true regeneration without spiritual activities now this is where we need to turn not only to John chapter 3 but to the first epistle of John this is what Nicodemus is first struck by the signs that Jesus was doing now John in his first epistle amplifies this further and I don't have time to do more than just tell you where these places are this evening and I hope you may be able to read into this more yourself the man who is born of God that is the man who is regenerate the man who has this new birth will display certain things in his character says the apostle John the first he believes rightly about Christ 1 John 5 1 whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God that's the first mark then of the man who is born of God he believes rightly about Christ the second his character begins to show the marks of true righteousness 1 John 2 29 if ye know that he is righteous ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him so there will be a mark of righteousness that is sheer rightness of living in your life and character the third mark of those who are born of God quite simply is that they will love their fellow Christians 1 John 4 7 everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God the fourth mark those who are born of God overcome the world through faith 1 John 5 4 whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith and fifthly he who is born of God overcomes the wicked one 1 John 5:18. we know that whosoever is born of God does not go on sinning as he did before but he that is born of God keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not <coughs> so that there is no true spiritual activity without regeneration and there is no true regeneration without spiritual activity in the words of Jesus by their fruits ye shall know them one last thing thank you for listening so well you're very patient and long suffering which is a good biblical characteristic <laughs> men are born of God lastly by the word of God this is the significance of the word of God whether read, written or preached men are born of God by the word of God 1 Peter 1 verse 23 where Peter speaks 
of those whose faith and hope is in God, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Do you see how these same characteristics of the newborn come in? See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, even by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now this is the significance, you see, of the relation between the word of God and the new birth. You are born of God, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, even by the word of God which lives and abides forever. This is why the preaching of the word is so vital for the new birth. This is what we ought to be expecting as the word of God is preached to me, and as the word of God is read, and as it is put before people. This is why it's so important to get people to read the Word of God because the new birth is related to it. Old John Owen, the Puritan, who has some very turgid things in his past number of volumes and things hard to be understood and difficult to read. If you're wanting something to put you to sleep at night, my wife always suggests one of John Owen's volumes as the best possible treatment. But John Owen has got some lovely things to say, and one of the things he says about this in 1 Peter 1.23 is, It is the word of God which is the midwife that leads us to the birth in Christ. The Holy Spirit is the author of the new birth, born of the Spirit. The Word of God is the midwife, and out of this there comes newness of life in Christ. But if this is the kind of thing you see that men like Nicodemus and men like us mean, something that is altogether outside of the realm of human capability, what should this do for us? If this is our longing for people, we don't want anything less than this for those we have come to care for, for Christ's sake, do we? We don't want anything less than this. We don't want merely to indoctrinate people. Men can indoctrinate other men, you know, and make them fierce in their concern for the truth. But while we may indoctrinate people, only God can regenerate them. And we don't want anything less than this, the life of God in the soul of men. But you know, that means that the most important feature of any work and of any evangelism, well, you know what it is, don't you? It's prayer. Isn't it? Not of the will of man, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. To whom do we repair to, therefore, for this work? Well, clearly to him. You know, I think we've got all mixed up in our thinking about the work. You know how we talk about praying for the work? I'm sure Pat knows how people tell him they're praying for the work, you know. And there are others who are really doing the work, but we are praying for the work. You know, that's all wrong. Because it's prayer that is the work, isn't it? It's the hardest work. And that's why when someone once asked my brother who was the means of leading me to Christ and my mother and father, and the first Christian in my family for many generations, when someone said to him, where were you born again? I remember being puzzled because I didn't understand it at the time. He said, in my minister's study. Now when the day comes when it shall be written up that this man was born there, there may be many an insignificant corner in Dundee. Insignificant to you, 
but it shall be said in that day this man this girl was born there now may we pray Lord you've been so good to us to be keeping us even able to attend and to listen to your voice and we don't want to speak many words to you at the close of this day but we do want to come to you in earnestness and reality and we do long and pray that you will take the lessons of your word and apply them by the powerful ministry of your Holy Spirit to our hearts that there may be something done in us and then through us that may tell for the glory of your name and for the spread of your kingdom and now we pray that you will keep your hand upon us and bless us this night for your great name's sake. Amen.